You're watching Backyard Tech. Coming up this week, a Victorian principal gets a kid in a headlock. The Victorian recycling saga continues. A warning for power issues ahead of this year's summer. Victoria to decriminalise public drunkenness. And Victoria police lose the right to hold pursuit tactics quiet. This is the weekly wrap-up. The other news stuff from Backyard Tech. G'day everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome to this week's edition of the Weekly Wrap-Up, the other news stuff here at Backyard Tech for a Sunday morning. And a uh, fair bit to get through with this one. I've got a few opinions on multiple topics as well. So if you're not up for opinions, then don't watch this. Um, I'm going to kick it off with this, but I'll leave a link in the description below for this week's edition. There are videos and audio that obviously I'm not allowed to play due to, well, we know the reasons why. So I'm going to give you the crux of the story that caught my eye this week and, and then go over a few opinions I've got. The first one up, as always, this is from my beloved National 9 News, where I get a lot of my Victorian news from. Um, video shows Berwick Secondary College Vice Principal holding student in headlock. And my computer's frozen up again, hang on. There we go. Um, parents have jumped to the defense of a vice principal who was filmed holding a student in a headlock during a violent incident at a secondary school in Melbourne's Outer East. Footage, of the incident, footage from the incident at Berwick Secondary College this week appears to show the teacher holding a, down a 16-year-old boy before several other students pulled the teacher off. Police said they were called to Manuka Road campus and arrested three boys aged between 14 and 16. They were later released pending summons. The mother of a student told Nine News her son was the victim, was a victim and was trying to defend himself when he was put into a chokehold by a teacher. Well, it wasn't, it was the vice principal. Other witnesses said the assistant principal was trying to stop the violence and prevent anyone else being hurt. Kelly Randall, who has children attending the school, said the vice principal, quote, does an amazing job, close quote. At the end of the day, the kids don't run the school. Kids that are misbehaving should be accountable. Other parents told Nine News that the assistant principal probably did need to step in to quell the vicious fight. The assistant principal who tried to break up the fight was assaulted and received minor injuries. A 16 year old boy was taken to hospital but later released. Barrack principal Kerry Bolsh said in a statement on Tuesday, said in a statement released on Tuesday by the education department there was Quote, an, an altercation between students at the school earlier today, which prompted us to enact our lockdown procedure. Police are still investigating. Now, look, when I saw this on the Facebook feed for National 9 News, I had to agree with the vice principal's actions. There are some kids out there these days that are have absolutely no respect for teachers, no respect for uh, principals, and no respect for authority. Now, if you flip the coin on this topic and you let these kids fight it out, you've also got the ambos, you've got the police, and some of the parents would be yelling and screaming at the principal and the vice principal for not doing anything. One comment was you can break up a fight by not getting involved. How? Stop fighting, stop fighting. That's not going to work. You've got an all-in brawl like that. You've got to get in and break it up. The vice principal did what I believe is the only right thing to do, and that is to physically rip that student out of that fight. Now, if that requires him putting him into a headlock or dragging him by the scruff of the neck, I don't have a problem. There are some kids out there these days that need a good kick of reality up the backside. So my opinion is the vice principal did the right thing by getting in, and if he had to put the kid in a headlock to, to remove him from the situation, Fine. Now, Berwick Sec is, can be a rough place. You have a diverse range of cultural people out there, especially in that part of Melbourne. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think there's a problem. It, it, it's pretty nasty. You guys can watch the video for yourself. I'll leave a link in the description below for you guys to check it out for yourself. But I think the principal did the right... The vice principal, I'm sure, did the right thing. 
And the mother of that kid who claims her kid's a victim, well, if he's a victim, why was he active in the fight in the first place? Some reports in the media suggest that he was actually actively fighting rather than defending. Now, this is not good again. And I'm going to attempt not to go completely off my rocker here, but this is, this is bad. Summer power outages outage risk worsens for Eastern State. Eastern State, I'm sorry, report warns. Keep losing my mouse here. Households and businesses in, in Eastern States can expect a higher risk of blackouts this summer, especially in Victoria. The Australian Energy Market Operator's latest electricity statement of opportunity says more electricity supply or other actions are urgently needed to meet high demand during the season. Quote, compared to last year's forecast, AMO observes greater risk of load shedding due to uncontrollable but increasingly likely high impact, tail risk, events such as simultaneous unplanned outages during hot days, the report said. Close quote. A key reason for the risk is the failing reliability of aging coal-fired power stations. In Victoria this summer, unplanned outages at Luoyang A2 and Mortlake 2 pose a significant risk, quote unquote, of insufficient supply that could lead to involuntary load shedding, the report says, potentially leaving up to 1.3 million households without power, but not Parliament House. However, other states within the national energy market aren't expected to experience such problems this summer. The gradual closure of the Liddell coal-fired power station and a combination of high summer demand and unplanned generator outages will leave New South Wales exposed to significant supply gaps and involuntary load shedding, quote unquote, at peak times unless mitigation is taken in advance. In the longer term, an extra five gigawatts of committed new power generation projects over the next three years, most of which involve renewable energy, will only make a limited contribution to meeting demand during peak hours, the report says. Um, okay, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going to try and knock off my rocker here, but this just shows you how disconnected from reality the Greens here in Australia are. Last summer, 2018-19, Victoria had rolling blackouts. The Greens came out and said that renewable energy will keep the lights on in Victoria. Less than 2% of the power the state needed came from renewables. You see, in Spring Street in Melbourne, where Victorian State Parliament is, they have diesel generators, which keep the lights and the air conditioner running at Parliament House. Labor, Liberal, the Greens and the Independents. They don't have to worry about rolling blackouts because they've got freaking generators there. The Greens don't get it. Without baseload power here in the state of Victoria, we do not have enough electricity from renewable. What do you do if there's no sun and no wind? The Greens are adamant that renewable energy like solar and wind and battery will keep the lights on at Victoria's highest demand 24-7. No, sorry, not going to happen. I'm going to put my, I'm going to put it out there. I don't have a problem with Australia getting a couple of nuclear power plants. We're the world's biggest exporter of uranium. We don't even use it for ourselves. Consecutive Labor and Liberal governments, both state and federally, have stuffed the country's electricity. A 21st century country like Australia should not have power problems. The Greens can't get it through their head. The renewable energies aren't enough to keep the lights on 24-7. Not going to happen. But they're not worried. The other problem we've got here in the state is the damn government 
The Greens have got the government wrapped around their finger so tight. We've got a mor moratorium on on-land, onshore gas exploration. And we're going to run out of power again. Dead set in the Fed Income Department. Why? The Greens don't get it. Yeah, okay, we've got coal-fired power plants. They provide our base load power for crying out loud. For us to keep the lights on, you would have to have wind farms and huge solar farms right across the state, probably with a solar tower as well, and a thermal a solar thermal plant that's up there in far northwestern Victoria with gigawatts of backup electricity. Otherwise, you're not going to keep the lights on. 2018-19 summer, we had people without power, food was going off, the whole lot. Daniel Andrews and the Labor government couldn't give a rat because they were comfortable at Parliament House. They didn't have blackouts. They've got gener diesel generators there. Not biodiesel, diesel. And do you reckon the Greens are saying anything? Nothing. Liberal, Labor, Greens, Democrats, the whole lot, state and federal, have stuffed this country's electricity grid by years of bickering and no solid plan. I say go nuclear. Let's get a model that we know works, whether it's the European model or the American model, and run it. Sure, it's short-term financial pain for long-term electricity stability gain. It's as simple as that. Oh, no, you can't do that. <sighs> so if I go off the air over summer, you'll know why. Victoria's recycling crisis continues and the government still can't do anything about it. They're dithering as always here in the state of Victoria. Um... Victorian recross, recycling crisis sees opposition call freeze on tip tax. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Victorian opposition is calling for a freeze on tip taxes as the cost of the state's recycling crisis continues to grow. The collapse of SKM recycling has forced many councils to dump their recyclables, but the government says landfill fees are being used to fund financial support. The company was using five warehouses to store 60,000 metric tonnes of surplus waste, but it's now gone into administration and landlords are at a loss what to do. The owners of a warehouse in Derrimut say they're already more than half a million dollars out of pocket in overdue rent and bills from SKM and their property is still going to be tied up for some time with up to six months and three million dollars needed to clear the waste. The recycling giant's operational arm has confirmed its Coolaroo and Laverton sites have been cleaned up and are ready to run if they are given the green light from the administrators or a new operator. But some councils have begun sending their recyclables to the tip, prompting the coalition to call for a freeze on landfill fees. We are down here. I know we are. Yet the government let it slide. And now they're dithering and panicking because they don't know what to do. And this isn't just happening here in Victoria. This SKM is nationwide, okay? Um, yes, I think there should be a freeze on tip taxes because until something gets sorted out, the government's not going to give full financial support back to the councils. That's granted. That happens here in Victoria every time. Doesn't matter which political party is running the state. They always pocket a proportion of the money into consolidated revenue. Right? So, <laughs> you know, fair suck of the old sauce bottle here. Um, it's completely immoral for Daniel Andrews to be charging Victorians a tax for recycling crisis that he created. The opposition claims fees generated $240 million a year, but only $40 million is spent on recycling. The government says the levies are being invested back into affected councils. Well, I don't think Geelong's got any of it yet. We're doing a lot of work to ensure that recycling is improved for the current situation, Robin Scott said. No, you're not. You're not doing anything about it. So, Victoria just plods through a 
hell of a mess as per usual. Always happens here in the state of Victoria. Um, this is concerning. I don't like this idea myself. Here in Victoria, we have a big problem with alcohol fueled violence. Although, um, to be brutally honest, if you do get hauled in front of the court with the SJWs we've got running the Victorian court system, you probably get off with a CCO. Um, Victoria moves to decriminalise public drunkenness, but Neil Mitchell says something is something about the announcement is dodgy. I don't like this idea. We've got a big problem in the mall in Geelong with public drunkenness, and now they're going to decriminalise it. Public drunkenness will no longer be a crime in Victoria as the Andrews government moves to redefine alcohol abuse as a health issue. The government's decision was driven by calls from the, from the Indigenous Australian community. Aboriginal people are overrepresented in public drunkenness figures and the abolition of the offence first recommended by the Royal Commission into Aboriginal custody, deaths in custody 28 years ago. An expert reference group has been established to determine how to appropriately deal with people found drunk in public but the details are lacking. Narita Wright, CEO of Victorian Aboriginal Legal Services, is on the committee, and she's fairly vocal. She said she was only invited to be part of the reference group a few hours before the decriminalisation of the offence was announced. The reference group hasn't been briefed, there's no established timeline for their meeting, and the government hasn't committed to any funding to funding health responses for those found drunk in public. Quote, there was no announcement around the resourcing commitment might look, sorry, there was no announcement around what the resourcing commitment might look like, Ms. Wright told 3AW. We would hope along with this announcement there is a commitment to resource whatever therapeutic response is agreed to by this expert reference group and the state. Um, I don't like this idea. Now, I'm not, look, whether you're talking Indigenous Aussies or white Aussies, okay, it doesn't matter. We have a big problem with public drunkenness, not just here in Victoria, around the country. Now, apparently, us and Queensland are the only two states left in the country that hold public drunkenness as a criminal offence. I don't want to see it changed. We've got alcohol fuel violence problems both in Melbourne, Geelong and other major regional centres around the state. I don't like the idea. I know here in Geelong we've got a big problem with public drunkenness, both with Indigenous Aussies and white Aussies. Huge problem in the middle of Geelong. Suffice to say the police have to go there daily because there's an alcohol fueled punch-up. It's no longer a criminal offence to be drunk in public. So if this gets through, all right, and let's say at the footy, which has been notorious this year around Victoria for alcohol fueled drunken behaviour. We've had punch-ups. Does that therefore mean that you're no longer charged with assault? You can go in into the MCG or Marvel Stadium, sink an absolute skin fill, come out, belt the hell out of someone, and instead of getting a double whammy with being charged with drunk in a public place and assault, you just get charged with assault? Does being drunk in a public place include drink driving? That's public. Don't like this idea whatsoever. The, the government's cobbled this one together. As per usual, Victoria's a bit slow on the old uptake factor. It's only taken 28 bloody years. But, hello? I don't like this idea. Now, okay, most Aussies will know that Victoria is backwards. Yeah, that's fine. That's fair enough. The government thinks we're a progressive state, but we're more backwards than New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, Northern Territory and WA, let alone the ACT in Tasmania. I mean, Victoria is the most backward state in this country. The Andrews government would have you feel that we're the same as Western Australia and progressive, but we're not. We're backwards. We are so far behind the rest of the country with with certain things, it's weird. This, I don't like the idea of, because what you're going to find is people claiming that they were just drunk. 
don't like it. This had to come out. Now, the Burke Street Rampage was one of the most violent acts of, dare I say it, terrorism Melbourne has seen since the 80s on a massive scale. The Burke Street Rampage was devastating. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to, blow the horn here for Victoria and I don't give a flying stuff if the rest of my Australian viewers don't see this as a terrible event but this was horrific this hurt every Victorian to see this happen in the middle of Melbourne we were once the world's most livable city we're now becoming the country's most violent city and state. Victoria's, Victoria Police loses bid to have Burke Street Rampage report kept secret. Victoria Police has lost the bid to have documents relating to the 2017 Burke Street tra tragedy kept a secret. Police Chief Commissioner Graham Ashton launched a legal battle for the critical incident report to be hidden. But coroner Jackie Hawkins said to Jackie Hawkins today ruled against the police force allowing cru crucial documents to be released and so they should be. Christy Mayer, Channel 7 News reporter said police said the police bid to keep the documents a secret was opposed by the victims families. They really wanted an evaluation of what else could have been done to prevent this. So they really needed to s those details out there, she told 3OW's Tom Elliott. Police argued they wanted the details suppressed for the sake of their members. Their argument was they wanted to, these to remain a secret to protect the officers involved and allow them to effectively do their job without fear or favour, Miss Mayor said. The inquest into the tragedy begins this November. It is expected to examine why police who followed James Gargasoulis before the rampage, did not stop him. It is not yet known if the police report will be made public prior to the inquest. Now, I don't care if it doesn't come out in public, but the victims needed to know why. Highway Patrol, the crime squad, uh, didn't act to stop him. There was vision of him during a news report of his violent act in Windsor behind a National 9 news reporter only a few hours before the Burke Street rampage. Vic Pohl did nothing. They stood back. Cert or Soggies, public order response, and Highway Patrol did nothing. And they knew they had to get him. But someone higher up stopped the frontline Pete, the frontline cops doing anything. I'm with the victims on this. They need to know why Vic Pole let him go as long as they did. If they had got him, if the officers had had the right from upstairs to nail him before the rampage, the rampage may not have happened. I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened, but maybe he wouldn't have got to Burke Street. They may have been able to stop him at the intersection of Flinders and Swanston, where he was doing donuts in the middle of the intersection. Right in front of Flinders Street train station. Right? He may not have got to Burke Street. He might have got up Swanston, but he may not have got as far as Burke Street. You know, to give you an idea, my international viewers, Burke Street from Swanston, from Flinders Street, is one, two, three, four, five blocks up. So you've got Flinders, Flinders Lane, Little Collins, Collins, Burke. 
Jason Kay. He may not have got to Burke Street. He may not have got up to Collins Street. They may have been able to stop him at Little Collins or Flinders Lane. No. He got all the way up to Burke Street. I'm with the victims on this. They need to see that report. They have to know what the hell went wrong. Now, okay, you can use the analogy that operational... Uh, operational documents from Victoria Police should never be made public. Okay, that's that's okay. I can I can go along with that. I can go along with that. Okay, because you don't want public order response, critical incident response, soggies, or highway patrol. You don't want that coming out if it's gonna give a leg up to the criminals on how to beat them, granted. But when you've got an inquest into one of Victoria's most recent nasty criminal acts that has hurt so many people, not just the victims themselves and the victims' families, those who witnessed it in the middle of Burke Street, so you got offices and shops and businesses, then you need to know why they didn't do anything. Now, before I say anything else, I'm not going the people in the cars that were thinking. They're taking orders from someone higher up. So that someone higher up bodged it. The news report behind National 9 News Melbourne's female reporter went out on the Today Show. Victoria Police saw it and they still didn't get him. Now he's... He's more mentally worse off than old mate. He makes me look stable. I'm sorry, I'm with the victims. They had to see that report. Sorry. They have to see that report. They have to know why what happened happened. There we go. That's the weekly wrap-up for this week. Guys, I'm not doing CCTV today. I will do it tomorrow for TBIM instead here at the Backyard Tech Channel. What I am going to do today is what I would suggest anyone else in my position does today, and that's to stump up in front of the couch or stump up on the couch grab the remote to the teeth and completely and utterly veg out for the rest of the day because that's exactly what I'm going to be doing. I will catch you tonight for the convos, guys. Enjoy your Sunday. Cheers.